Alrighty. Guys, first cab off the rank today, I'm very excited to have Mr. Jeremy McGovern joining us. So if anyone doesn't know about Jeremy, you're going to know very shortly. So as I said, this is going to be a Q&A based style. So I've got plenty of questions locked and loaded. But if you guys do have questions, apparently he likes to talk. I like to talk. <laughs> it's going to be successful. That's what I got told. So guys, give Jeremy a huge round of applause. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming and joining us. No worries. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. I do like talking a little bit, but <laughs> not as much as some. Beauty. So, I mean, uh, so I also run a podcast, if anyone doesn't know, Kim Barrett Show. Like and subscribe. But the question I always ask people at the start of that, and I thought I might start that off with you as well, which is if you met someone at a party and let's just say they don't watch AFL, what do you tell them that you actually do? Because I've only got a bunch of small businesses as well. Like, what's your go to answer? My is plumber. I just say I'm a plumber. Yeah. Um, I've got a plumbing company on the side. Um, I've got electrical and, and, and concrete now as well. But yeah, I just say I'm a plumber, tradie, because I'm a tradie at heart. I was a tradesman before I, uh, I got drafted. So. And if they don't know that I play football, they're the type of people I want to sort of hang out with a little bit more, so I'll probably have a beer with them. Yeah, beautiful. So guys, just feign that you don't know anything about AFL and <laughs> you can have a beer with Jeremy. And now, just a side note on that, obviously you're having a couple of businesses being this time, and I think I saw on your Instagram a few times posting about how hard have you found it to get staff? Yeah, massively. It's the big, biggest challenge, I think, in pretty much all industries, I think, throughout WA. I know definitely in the, in the trade industry, it's, it's extremely hard to get workers, and then it's just getting quality workers as well. There's always a couple of people out there who claim to be very good workers, um, and sometimes you've got to find out the hard way. But yeah, that's the biggest challenge, I think, for everyone at the moment, is, is getting workers and then getting quality ones to to keep doing the work that you need done. Yeah. Now, I do I definitely have a bunch of uh, business questions for you as well, but to kick us off, tell us a little bit about your experience, like obviously from going through going through a draft, which I think is yep. actually going on at the moment as well. Yep. Um, how did you find that experience and then getting into a team and growing through there? Yeah, it was um, it was a bit different for myself. Um, obviously, the draft day, so if anyone doesn't know the draft, it's where you get picked up as a young kid and um, pretty much in a lottery and you get, go to whichever club they picture. I was different. I was obviously, like I said, a tradesman and I was doing actually ele electrical apprenticeship. I was just working generally day to day. I was in a big hole. I remember it clear as I was in a massive hole and digging hole. Um, and I was hating me off. It was 35 degrees and I got a call from my cousin saying I've just been picked up from West Coast. But if you watch the kids these days, they, they have draft parties. So they're all having a party with all their mates, um, expecting, waiting to get drafted. Well, I was the opposite. I had no, no idea I was going to get picked up. I always loved football, don't get me wrong, and I always wanted to play it, but uh, it wasn't everything to me. So, yeah, I ended up getting drafted, and, and I, my life changed within a matter of minutes or hours. I was on the phone to John Moore's club at the time, uh, the footy club at the time, and I've gone from a fat tradie kid to a professional athlete like that. That's literally what you had to do, and I'd never really grown up knowing too much of that sort of side of things, um, and that side of things for AFL football and professional Sport is pretty much 90% of it, and the other 10% is actually playing. Where I'm sort of more of a player, I just like playing the game. Uh, so I had to adjust my life. Yeah, it changed within within hours. I think two days later, I was in with a host family. I was in at the footy club training, doing running programs, which I've never done before, doing weights programs, never done before, um, and then trying to fit into this completely new culture, which was a footy club and a, and a very successful one in that. So it was very quick. Everything happened very fast. And yeah, I just pretty much had to try to fit in as, as well as I could. What was the biggest sort of like culture shift for you joining, as you said, like joining a footy club and seeing that? Like, because I think a lot of times people don't necessarily know what the cultures are like. They can see obviously the team on the field, but like, what was it actually like when going into the club and what was the, and I'm sure there might have been some culture shifts as well over a couple of years. Yeah, there was. Um, for me, I was a bit in awe. I was running around with guys, Dean Cox. If anyone knows Dean Cox, these are the sort of idols I looked up to when I was a, a kid and I'm, you know, next thing you know, I'm, I'm next to him in the locker room and they're saying good day to me. So you're a bit, you're a bit glassy eyed for the first three or four months and you're a bit blown away and you just try and soak it all up and, and enjoy it as much as you can. But at the same time, it is, it's a professional environment. So you go from not getting, it's not, you're not getting judged, but everything's getting measured. As soon as you walk in there, it's how do you rock up to training? Does he look tired? Does he look like he's had a good sleep? Has he been out partying? Has he been drinking? Has, and then how's he trained? Um, how's his body look? How well did he run? So you go from this 
lifestyle of a tradie where you just sort of float through and you can do what you want to getting judged the whole time and, and, and monitored because that's just a professional environment that you're in. So I was adjusting to that and how you had to conduct yourself and handle yourself. And uh, for me, it was you go to work, you're a tradesman, you go to work and you sort of do your stuff at work and um, complete your tasks, whatever you need to do, then you can go home and switch off. With footy, you can't. It's a 24-hour thing. Uh, it took me a long time to really realise that all the stuff you're doing at home behind the scenes actually impacts what you do when you do get to the club and in that environment. So, uh, yeah, that was that was a big adjustment. But the culture at the footy club was extremely professional and it was very much everything was result sort of driven. Everything was you had targets you had to meet. If you don't meet the target, you've got to do extra work or you're going to be not punished, but you you know you're going to have some some hard words uh, with some some high end people. So um, but that was just the environment. Work hard and, and work for things, and um, and this is the processes and ways you can go through it. And a lot of it was setting goals and, and setting standards and, and meeting them. If you don't, they can hold you accountable. And how did you find the leadership style coming through? Obviously, now like running businesses, really, you know, leading and um, running the captaincy of a team as well. But when you first came in, what were some of the things that you like kind of picked up from John Worsall from a leadership perspective? Yeah, so John was. My well, first coach, um, I had him for three and a half years and um, I've got I was Adam Simpson now. Um, yeah, but completely two different sort of coaching styles and, and different sort of methods, I think, to it. Busher, John was very much athletic-based, work hard, uh, train hard. Do, if someone says do a 100-metre sprint, do a 110-metre sprint, he was just very driven on that sort of side, but that was his strength. He was a physical guy. He was very good athletically. So that was sort of his style, where Simo's, Adam Simpson's style, is more smart. I want to be a smart footballer. He's more statistics. How well can we beat him with a system? Where Wisher was, how can we beat him up? That was, that was, that was his method. Um, it worked. Don't get me wrong. They both, both have their, their pros and cons. But, um, so yeah, Wisher early days, like I said, was, was great. Cause he, he taught me, instilled all that hard work into you and, and all those sort of small little one percent of things where Simo's more, uh, how can we do this smarter? I went through a stage when I was with Wusher and I played football because I loved it. I still do love it, but there's all this other stuff that you got to do. Like I said before, there's 90% of things you got to do, which is weights, running, you're weighing food. When I was getting there, I was weighing my food and, I'm, and I wasn't allowed to drink. I'm thinking, what, the, what is this? I've, I've come to a footy club. I'm meant to be playing football. I'm doing all this other stuff. I'm doing meetings. I'm doing yoga. I'm doing all this. And I get to play footy for an hour on the weekend. It's not, it's not what I signed up for. And it, it eventually, it, it, it it wore me, wore you down a fair bit because that's just, that's the way I am. There's other boys these days who would love that. They, they do love that. But Simo come into the system and he was more fun. All right, Gov does not like running. He doesn't like chasing a white line and running. So what we'll do is we'll just give him footy and we'll just do longer drills. So he's actually running. I'm still getting fit. I'm still doing everything, but I'm doing it with a ball, with a footy. It's what I like. And there's a lot of boys that are like that. So that's sort of the two different me- methods where Wusher was like, nah, mate, you've got to, just grit your teeth and get it done. Sim, I was more like, hang on, what type of bloke are This is what you saw. Well, we can cater to you a little bit and help you out. Um, so that was sort of the two different styles, both great. But, um, yeah, I've, I've had to adjust. If I was leaning towards one, I'd, I think Simo's style is probably more suited for this, especially this generation um, and sort of back end of my generation. Now, like, being that you own a company as well, um, or a few companies now, and you've got your businesses going, the way that I see a football team, you kind of got the coach almost like the CEO and then you've got like the, you've got your captains and you've got your leadership, which kind of also are like your leadership team in a business. How do you, how did you see that leadership kind of filtering down from the top into the team, into all the players, obviously up and coming players and things like that as well? Yeah. Simo, Adam Simpson, very big on it. And you say you obviously go from Simo down, but it actually, it probably starts from the top of our footy club with, um, with Trevor Nisbet, the CEO. So he's very much the same. It, it, it sort of, it's exactly that. It's a, pretty much a pyramid that filters down and um, everyone has roles and responsibilities and a lot of the responsibilities of each person is the people who are underneath you. So my responsibility as a leader now is who the young kids coming through that I need to help push them and progress them into leadership uh, or help them as much as they can with their leadership. It's not a one size fits all. I think everyone's got different styles and, and different um, strengths, different weaknesses. Something that we've I've learned from Simo is very much what your strength is. You need to really glorify your strength Work on your weaknesses, but your strength is, is what's got you here. So for us, it's more identifying, oh, what is this? So for, for instance, mine was a lot of on-field stuff. Um, I was a very good leader on-field. So Simo was very much, all right, mate, your on-field's really good. Let's, 
let's really keep working on that. And you, you need to get your off-field stuff sort of right. And off-field is, uh, is more of setting examples. I'd first want to put my hand up and say, I'm, I don't set the best examples for people off the field. If you, you're writing a perfect leadership book up, there's, there's things there that I'm, I'm not the best at. That's just not my strength, but there's others that are, are really good. So yeah, the, it goes from Simo to us leaders and then to the, sort of emerging leaders was what we call it. And then it goes pretty much to the rest of the playing group. A lot of things need a, you need a filter big time. So what we what you talk about with Simo, you sort of got to filter it between Simo and the young young player that you sort of might be giving feedback to or, or need to speak to. It sort of needs to go through a filter line and that's that's us and that's our role. Yeah, it's um it is it's we've it's spoken about week so we have weekly meetings for the leadership group. He Simo would have fifteen meetings with different people in different areas of our footy club and the meetings pretty much are to get clarity on what's going on what do we need to do what do we need to fix um, a lot of it was fixing last year with our, with our season the way we we're going and the look of the footy club and, and what direction we're going we weren't performing so a lot of it's that a lot of it is we're doing really well how do we maintain this so yeah there's a, there's a lot of structured meetings and the whole footy club's pretty much is a leadership structure from like I said from the CEO down so when you came in as a, as a young guy you just jumped out of the hole and uh yeah. Started getting ready to run around. What sort of stuff did you pick up from the leaders that were that came before you, and like what did they kind of instill in you to carry forward? Yeah, that, that's a good good one because I picked up everything that they not everything, but they, you know, you just sit back as a young kid, and when I look at it now, and at that time I was just picking up little cues from what Dean Cox or Dan Glass was doing or Eric McKenzie. You just pick up little things here and there, and you don't realise you're picking it up, but they just just because you. They do it all the time and it's repetitive and that's just the way that they operate. You sort of see it and you just naturally slowly start doing little things like that yourself. And now I'm, I'm sort of that guy, I guess, at the footy club where you've got young kids looking at you. So I talked about the example, sending the example before. That's something I'm working on so I can show kids just through my actions rather than telling them. Cause those boys never really, they didn't never really told you what you need to do and what you don't need to do. It was more, Hey mate, we're here for you, but just follow what I do. Um, this is the example I'm setting. This is the way we operate. This is the way our culture is, mate. You've got to do what we do. I'm not going to have to tell you. You just need to figure it out because sometimes you can't. It's very hard to tell people. Sometimes everyone needs to figure it out in their own ways. Sometimes it's, it's through lived experiences. Sometimes it's through conversation. Sometimes it's through, for me, I, I almost got delisted when I was in my fourth year. Uh, so mine was like a penny drop moment. I, you know, I had to really wake up and, and smell the roses, I guess, and, um, and change the way I was acting. So, there's a lot of different ways, but those boys were very much, this is the culture. This is what we're doing. You're coming along with us. And it's, it's more, you know, just, just follow us and, and do it your way. And if you step out of line, we'll, we'll let you know about it. If not, just keep doing what you're doing. So, um, which I really liked. I thought it was, it was great. And, and it really, they didn't force anything on you. They didn't, they didn't tell you, you have to do this, have to do that. It was more figure it out for yourself a little bit, but they were there to support you. So tell us a little bit more about that almost the listening moment. Cause what sort of le- like when I think about that, I think about staff and then you've got, you know, because everyone here is a, is a business owner as well. And it's like if you've got a team and obviously you all get to the point where it's like, well, like also for them, it's like you're going to have to fire someone soon. What was the, like, how did they help you come back from that point? Because obviously you could let someone go and be like, cool, you're cut, you're out, see you later. Versus obviously like supporting them and giving them the opportunity to become better and come back. And obviously for you, that's a pretty, pretty big success story going from that point to where you are now. Yeah. Um, so anyone doesn't know what I was, I was a rookie, so I was only, like I said, I got picked up really late. I didn't really know, um, that I was going to be drafted. It took me a long time to, like I said, with the professional sort of side of things. I got to the three year point with Busher, um, where I was just hating it. I was doing everything that I didn't really like doing. I was injured. I really hated it. And Busher obviously moved on and, and we were looking at a new coach. Um, and Adam Simpson got appointed. Um, and in that off season, I seen Simo for the first time. I was the first person to see him and I was training in my off season break because I'd been injured. Um, but that's, that's another thing. I'm, you've got an off season break. Um, and the club is still making me come to the club in my off season break to train because they don't trust me, which is on me. That's my fault. But at the same time, it's a bit of a balancing act. So anyway, I was in there and Simo come in and, um, I seen him and he goes, are you training in your off season break? I said, yeah, mate, I'm here. I'm training. And he goes, oh, great, mate. It's good to see you. And, you could tell as soon as I met him, he sort of, he knew, so I've never played before, but he sort of knew who I was. And I was like, how does he know who this fat rookie is from, from Albany? But I was, it was, it was a bit weird. And then I was going home and calling my mate saying, telling him I'm going to be playing on round one because he's seen me in, in the um, off season break. And then off the back of that, I, I ended up going to Phuket for four weeks. It was one of the greatest off seasons I've ever had. Um, 
But uh, it wasn't great. When I come back, it wasn't. I put a heap of weight on. I hadn't trained. I was running running laps, and they told me to stop. And this is how naive I was. I was. I didn't even know how big I was. I was just, no, I'll, I'll be fine. Running laps, and they told me to stop. Like, I've come put, come out, mate. And I said, oh, great. They're just managing me for low. They don't want me to train too hard. That, that's just how silly I was. And then uh, I got pulled in a couple of hours later. They said, come in, mate. You're in for a meeting. Went in for the meeting. And as soon as you walk in a footy club and there's 15 people in a meeting room, it's, it's not good. Not good at all. I was like, oh, what's going on here? And Simo goes, mate, Gov, how do you think you're presented? And I said, oh, mate, I was like, okay. Oh, obviously pulled me out for a bit of loading and stuff like that, but I'm ready for it. He goes, nah, mate, you're the fattest bloke I've ever seen in a footy club. <laughs> Literally, that's how he said, no, if I've never seen a fatter bloke. <laughs> um, it wasn't that nice either. So I was like, oh, sugar, here we go. All right, we're on. Um, and then, uh, and then he sort of meant he's like, he just said, I've heard you're a really good fella and, and everyone loves you around the footy club, but, um, I don't really care at the moment because you're not presenting well and this is not what I stand for. He was a coach. He's just come in. He needed to set an example. Um, unfortunately for me, I was that example. And he just said, you know, so he looked at the list manager and so said, look, should we just delist him now and save the hassles and just move him on? And I was like, whoa, that's, um, that's very, oof, okay. And I was sitting there and obviously you start getting all glassy eyed and tearing up and, and then they were back and forth, bit of good cop, bad cop set up. And um, he goes, no, nah, look, what we'll do, we'll send you away for four weeks. You're not allowed at the footy club. You're not allowed to be here when the boys are here. You can train before and after them. Um, you've got to get to this weight and you've got to get to these running times. If you don't, you're gone. And I was like, oh, far out, all right. So I had to drop, like, it was eight and a half kilos in four weeks, which was a lot. I think he sort of thought, mate, if you do that, far and well done, which I did. Um, and I literally walked out of there, bought a bike. I was a rookie. I was getting paid 20 grand a year or whatever it was. I went and bought a bike with the last bit of money I had and I just started riding everywhere, rode to training. I did all that sort of stuff and come back in good shape. But the thing is with with Simo, I think he sort of understood what I loved about footy and what I loved about footy is, is camaraderie. I'll do it with my teammates. So he's taken that away from me, which I which hurt me the most. So I like, don't get spent, like you're going through all these tough times. You want to do it with your teammates. You want to do it with people, enjoy it, embrace it. Um, so I had to do it by myself and I hated it. And it really ate me up. Um, so that was like a little small thing. And then come in and, and had me meeting. And, um, you know, Simo just sort of mentioned, mate, I'm glad you've come back. You've done, done such a good job. I want to, I want to bring you back and you can, and start training again. Um, and for me, the part that I knew I worked so hard, I did everything great. But the only thing that really tweaked me and, and triggered me was he had belief. You could tell he had, he had belief in me. Because he, they could have, the easiest option was just get rid of me. Um, and for him to just go, look, I'm so proud of what you've done. I think you can play footy. I know you can play footy. I just need you to get fit. Can you just go out there now? I don't want to hear boo from you. Just go out there and do your thing. Um, and start training. And the next time I'm hoping is, I'm speaking to you is when we're talking about footy. I was, there was the first time someone sort of shown a bit of belief in, in the fat kid from Albany who's a rookie. Um, so for me, it was like, all right, well, this guy's stuck his neck out for me a little bit. I've, it's not that I owe him, but I, you know, I wanted to repay him for giving me a chance and I ended up playing that year, um, round seven and he did everything he could to get me in the side. I was a forward at the time and he moved me to the back line to try and get me in and I was arguing with him, I'm, I'm a forward. He goes, mate, I want to get you in the side because I think you can play. Uh, so that belief lifted again and that sort of stemmed on from there and I've, I've sort of played ever since and he's really pushed leadership into my, onto myself and so he's been a massive caveat for for me, and, and the, but the, that penny drop moment was it was more the, the showing of belief. Like a, the the biggest thing is, mate, I'm, I'm back. You know, I believe you can do it. And then it was up to me. And I, I, that was all. That's the only tool I really needed. To be honest, was was a bit of belief that someone really rated me um, and wanted me to do it. So, um, yeah, that was sort of that penny drop moment, I guess, where where it started. You mentioned the, that obviously off off field leadership you're working on yeah. versus on field. So tell me a bit about the on field leadership. Like, what does that look like? How do you show up there? Yeah, it's, it's obviously you, you set an example on the field. We, you know, we, we do trademarks every year. So if anyone doesn't know what a trademark is, it's sort of what you stand for. So we have an on-field one and an off-field one. Um, we'll have our KPIs and, and, you know, actions we like to see on the footy field. I feel like I'd, I do do that through the, through the way I play, um, the communication side. And then it's more the understanding. So when, when, when things are tough and uh, things aren't going our way, I'd like to pride myself that boys look, look to myself to go, Gov, what are we doing? What's happening? Because I feel like I understand the game really well and more this is what's happening and we need an objective and what, what we need to do to fix it or um, a clear path on what, what we need to do and 
I feel like I do do that, and um, I've got feedback for which I do do that well. So yeah, that's sort of the, more the on-field stuff is is more direction, communication, helping boys and making sure everyone stays calm. The biggest thing is staying calm in footy because everything's it gets chaos there for a bit, especially down in the back line when we're getting goals kicked on us left, right, and centre. And you got people screaming everywhere. You got different personalities on the field. The backmen are normally more calmer blokes. And then we've got midfields and forwards who love squealing and, and carrying on and barking orders and, and all that sort of, where you just sort of need to calm the shit, which you love. You, I, I love that from, from the boys because they're, they're passionate and they want to win. But it's just how do we calm them down and, uh, and, and have a clear objective that everyone's clear so they know what to do. Uh, so that's sort of more the on-field stuff, which I hope and I, I'm, yeah, I'll keep trying to, uh, strive to just, to do that as much as I can on the footy field. And you mentioned obviously communication being kind of key there. What does effective communication look like when there's like shit's going down, you're getting goals kicked on you, you've got, you know, like some people might be losing a little bit of heart. Like what do you, like how do you approach that from your communication from a leadership style? Yeah, or well, there's different, so that's the thing. Sometimes you just got to, you got to read the cues and, and go, go with your gut most of the time. For me, it's just going with what I think. And um, sometimes it's, it's, if it's effort, it's, it, it's warrants a spray and, and a harsh bit of feedback. Um, sometimes it, you know, you can do everything right. You can, everything was perfect. Setup was great. Effort was there, but they kicked the goal. So we, we, you can't, that's, that's life. That's footy. You can't really do much about that. So sometimes it's, mate, let's just move on. Boys, they've had a really, the grand final in 2008, the first five goals they kicked. We couldn't, they were great goals. And we looked back and said, look, hats off to you. That's really good footy. We can't do much about that. Let's just stay calm and keep doing what we're doing. And obviously it eventually turned, but you know, that they're, they're sort of the cues you got to read. And it's, and it's goes back to your trademark. Are they outside the trademark? Of, was there effort there? Were they compliant? Do they know what the setups were? Do they know what, you know, style of play we're in at the moment? If they do, great. Tick, tick, tick. It's fine, mate. It's more keep giving them confidence to keep doing what they're doing. If not, it's hang on. Mate, you didn't know the structures, what's going on. You better go figure it out next time you go to the bench, figure out the structures because that hurt us that time. Um, and it's more, I'm more direct. I'm, I'm probably too directed and that's part of my leadership style is I'm aggressive. So I need to try to dampen that down as much as I can. And it's more follow up. So on the field, heat of the moment, you, you just, you have to say it and say it. But if you feel it's come across the wrong way, you've really got to follow up. So that's what quarter time's for. That's what after the game's for. Mm. That's why I like having beers after the game is because you can actually sit down and go, mate, so I'm so sorry for calling you whatever <laughs> I bloody called you. You know, I love you. I was just bloody heated up, mate. I'm so sorry. And that's, that's why it's good after the game. And the, and the boys are very good at it. But, um, yeah, that's, that's more of the stuff you, you, um, you're weighing up throughout the game is, is what's, you know, type of feedback you need to give it. Is it really harsh and direct or is it more, hang on, it's confidence. Let's, let's, let's pump them up a little bit. And what's, how does your responsibility lie? Obviously being in the, working in the captaincy, but obviously being on, in the back line as well. Are you then responsible for kind of like the entire team across the field? Or are you like, are you almost like managing key areas? Bit of both. Um, I'm fortunate enough. I've got an ex-captain, which I still call him a captain. Um, is, is Shannon Hearn down back, who's been massive for me. So I'm, I'm, I'm blessed that I get to bounce off him as much as I can. Um, but at the, when you're, when you are the captain, it's more holistic. So I'm lucky that he can sort of handle the backline stuff as a six. Um, and I can sort of see what's going on with the team and the whole structure. And, and I'm more, my communication's a lot more with, with Simo and our line coaches. So I'm more bounced between myself and the coaches. What's going on? How do we change this? What are we looking at? What do you think about this? And then the backline stuff is also let the boys nut it out. Um, unless I, I feel like there's something there, but, um, most, most of the, most of the time we, our backline's pretty prepared. Um, that's the biggest thing. You, you need to be prepared. Your prep is, is number one thing, uh, before you run out. If everyone's prepared and clear, um, everything on game day seems to work and is a lot easier. But yeah, my communication, obviously, when you are captain and, and vice captain is, is between the other leaders and, and Simo is pretty much, pretty much the main chats and it's, it's more holistic rather than individual areas. How is that actually communicated? Cause obviously it's pretty hectic being out there. Are you just waiting for kind of quarter time to catch up or is it like, Constantly throughout the game. Yes, it's throughout the game consistently within every time there's a sort of a stop play, there's something. Um, we've got signs on the, on the, um, on the boundary. We've got the phones that we call when we get onto the bench. We've got blokes who are running on, screaming stuff out. So yeah, the communicate, that's, it's changing all the time. It's heaps, it heaps, so much communication. Sometimes it's too much. Sometimes it's change, change, change. And by the time the, the only, the, the difference is the lag. Simo's in the box. We're on the ground. By the time that message comes out, it's been three or four minutes because they're discussing it. They get it to 
JK, for example, one of the leaders, and he's trying to run on it, he might be five minutes before he can get on the ground. So by the time that happens, the game might have changed again. So, yeah, it's very hard to, to get those communication lines quick, but that's you just got to keep them open, um, and we need everyone talking. How did you find it when you got the kind of tap on the shoulder to come up into leadership, into obviously like vice captain role and things like that? What were some of the big uh, challenges for you stepping into that? It's probably the more the how's everyone see you as a leader. I'm, I'm very much a, um, I feel like people naturally have it and it's more when you're at a footy club, you sort of, your peers are the ones who sort of select you as a leader um, and you're coaching obviously. So my motto and still is, is if, if my teammates want me to be a leader, I'll do it. But it's nothing I've ever what got out of bed and said, I want to be the captain of West Coast. They go, oh, no, I was never that guy. I'll just even if I'm not the captain, I'm going to do the best I can no matter what. You do, I've got a tag now, which is great. And everyone sort of looks at you differently because you get a tag. But while my leadership wouldn't have changed, I'd still do the best I can in that space. But yeah, when Simo was going through, he sort of hit me up after a couple of years and said, mate, I think you've got great qualities. And have you ever considered it? And I said, no, I haven't. I would just do it the way I think I can do it. And he goes, well, I think you can do it really well. Your votes with the, with the players is, is increasing. And I think you, we need to try to develop you in some areas a bit more. And that was sort of the first time I, I thought about it. And then, yes, since then, we sort of just helped develop the way I, I lead and the way I, it's more you commit and the way you speak and the way you act rather than the way you think. I think he's very much, you know, you've got your own style, but this is just the perception. Um, and sometimes your perception is not exactly who you are. And I'm okay that I, I can do things the way I want. I can get away with them a little bit where you've got a young kid who can't. So it's just, it's just learning those little things. So where I went to a leadership program that the club runs, emerging leaders. I started that. Like that when I was probably four, three years before I was, you know, put into the leadership group, uh, and then from the leadership group you go vice captain, and then when when Luke's not playing, I'm I obviously captain. But um, yeah, I was just in leadership group, and it was a lot of it was yourself. So we do a lot of self reflecting. Uh, what type of person am I? Um, like I said before, anyone done a disc analysis? Yeah. So I, we did our disc analysis, and I'm very much aggressive red. <laughs> um, you know. So and the thing is, you you we do a disc at the footy club. And we do a disc when you're at home because you, you, you've got to you've got to change. You have to. So yeah, we, we do the two discs. I'm still very very red at home, <laughs> um, which my partner Maddie cops a fair bit. But um, yeah, so we we do the two discs, and and once you know yourself, you can understand yourself. You know how to give. It's easier for you to give feedback and lead people. So yeah, that was uh, we did the disc stuff. Look at looked at our profiles. Worked on a few areas that I needed to work on. I'm definitely still not perfect. I'm still learning every day, and I'm the first one to admit that. But I think it's just the thought. And I'm trying to learn and, and trying to change. And so, yeah, that's where it sort of stemmed from. And yeah, I'm here now and I'm sure by the time I die one day, I still won't be perfect at it. I don't think anyone will, but we'll still be learning. Yeah, it's been, it's been a good, good journey. And I've had a bit of a transitional, I feel like I've had a transitional change of the type of people that we're getting at the footy club. There's young, younger kids coming in now. A lot of it's sort of flipped before it was aggressive for me it was back, put me back 10, 15 years ago. I'm perfect. I'm the, just spray everyone, tell them how it is, shut up and move on. It's different now. You can't. The, the kids and people involved are a lot more emotional, which I'm not. I'm very much happy, sad, that's it. Like that. I can move on. It's just, you can call me whatever you want. I'll go, whatever. See you later. Where these kids are, they're mostly more in tune, which is, which is good as well. Um, but it is hard at times you, cause you don't want to hurt. It's not a personal thing. This is not personal. What I say to you is not personal. Sometimes boys do get personal and that's the balance, but a lot of it's not. A lot of it's just feedback. A lot of it's to help you grow where some of the kids and they, not even just kids. Um, some of the people involved in, in our industry, it is very emotional. Uh, so it's just how you, how you do it, how you give your feedback, it's different ways of doing it. And that's been the biggest challenge as being a leader is just seeing that little change. Did your leadership style have to change when you're playing those big games? When you're in the grand finals and things like that, did you find, uh, is it still kind of business as usual when you're out there or because there's obviously high stakes and it's like it, it is a big deal kind of getting to that point, did you have to, did anything adjust from a leadership perspective? Nah, nah, you're probably just a bit more alert to what all the other boys are doing. We, we had 2015, which was a debacle, a proper debacle. Yeah, we were, we thought we did everything we could, um, which we did. We don't worry. We try. We, we, but we'd never been there. We'd never gone through it. We, yeah, we didn't get the whole hyper. There was a lot of different things that happened. So we learned a heap from 15. I think we wouldn't have won 18 if we didn't have 15. Uh, that's my opinion. But, um, yeah, pretty much what we learned from 15, I was 
trying to do the opposite, really. In 18, I was going, well, this, this didn't work for us. Let's just, let's just dull this down. So a lot of it was the grand final play and the hype around it, the media and everything. So it, Simo's first one in 15 was just embrace, boys, embrace it. This is awesome. Just enjoy the whole thing. So we're going, yeah, hell yeah. We're all sitting on the, sitting on these parades. Everyone's screaming. We got Sonny's on. And look at us with the king of the, kings of the jungle. Ah, <laughs> six, this, this is awesome. This is what footy's about. Doing all the media. This is great. But then you get to the end of the game and you get spanked. No one cares about that. No one cares. Oh, I don't, I mean, who cares? No, no one does. So 18 was more, boys, we got a job to do. Let's get over there. We need to do what we need to do with the parade stuff. We know it's like, we, mate, once we win the grand final, you're not going to remember that. And you don't. So yeah, the biggest, <laughs> The thing with Simo, is he said, no sunny. So the first, this little stand was, take your sunnies off when you're on the, on the thing. We're not rock stars. Let's just get in. I was the only one who rocked up the sunnies off. <laughs> I rocked up late and I had my sunnies on. There's a photo of me and just before it, one, someone's got a video and I was got up on the thing and the, no, and the boys just, get your sunnies off, you rock star. I pulled my sunnies off, but they got a photo. So, um, Simo let me have it for, <laughs> for wearing them, but. Um, that was just sort of the different change. It was just more, boys, we've got a job to do. Let's get over there and do what we need to do what we need to do with this stuff. That's just part and parcel with it. That's that 90% that I talk about. So let's do that. We've got a job to do this, is what we're doing. And it's funny because both the games started very similar. We were down by five goals in the first quarter. Um, Hawthorne game, it was just stuff going over. Coaches were, mate, well, we've got to change this. We've got to do this. We've got to, we've got to, what are we doing here? We've got players. Everyone's glassy eyed look and uh, everyone's had it. it was just this glassy eyed look and everyone's sort of looking at each other and no one's taking anything in we're all shocked and then 18 was just dead calm Simo comes in boys this is the KPIs which we have our KPIs that we want to hit on game day look at them all in green everything's going great the only one that's in red is the scoreboard so we're doing everything right we need a few things to go away and I, he, he come and asked and said what's going on I said mate that a couple of those goals were bloody oh, ball terrors out. They're kicking from the pocket. One of them ran the whole way down the field. I went, if they're going to do that all day, then they should win. And he goes, yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm feeling the same way. I think it's, I think we're, we're on top, we're on top of this game. They've just kicked a few goals, really good goals. So it was calm and it was, boys, this is, this is what we need to do. We've got our KPIs. Let's just keep, keep at it in this area. And look, and he goes, forwards, can you just kick more goals? Mids, can you just get it in the forward line? Backs, can you just stop, stop some goals? That was it. That was it. That's that's how good, that's how easy AFL coaching is. So um, if anyone wants to do it, that's what you got to do. But no, that's that was the that, and we're all going. Yeah, I'm yeah, sweet. I'm, I'm I agree with you. <laughs> that's it. Literally, that's it. So just keep doing what we're doing and just just play in little areas. It took us to the last couple of minutes of the game, but you know that was sort of the two different uh, sides of it, and we learned a lot from that that 15 game. And and yeah, but the, when when it is getting tough, the pressure is on. It's just it's just staying clear. Keep, keep it to your focus points that, like I said, we, you have in going into a game. Um, when things don't go well, you obviously, you have individual focus points. So if I'm not playing too well, I've got my own things I like to go back to. So sort of two or three points and that makes, I feel like makes me a good player. And if I'm not going well, I'll just focus on aggression for me. There's probably one in, in the contest. So I'll just go hard at whatever contest, at the footy, at kicking, whatever it is. Um, as a team, you know, it might be defensive actions. A lot of it is defensive, not offensive stuff. So defensive action so, or work rate is a very clear one. So nothing's going well. Just work your ass off. Just for five minutes, just go as hard as you can for five minutes and things should, should start to change. Um, so everyone's got different things. So that's the main thing in those big games. You're just being very clear and just knowing what you need to get back, back into in the right, in the right headspace. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, that's the thing. It is another game. It really is. It, it's another game of footy. Uh, there's just a fair bit more hype and a bit more pressure around it. But yeah, you got to try and nullify that pressure as much as you can. I want to ask you jump jump to a few business questions as well. Um, but did anyone have any questions? And I'll relay them for the guys at home. Anyone have any overarching like leadership questions or anything else that we've kind of gone through so far? And if you guys can just ask them slowly, so I'll repeat them over here then here for the guys at home. Let me go first, man. So the question for the guys at home is laying out leadership tiers, how they work, structured, and how it trickles down. Yeah. So it's um, if you're going from the whole club. It's probably the CEO, or it's, it's actually the board. The board sits above everyone, and you've, you've got your CEO, um, and there's pretty much CEO to really football manager and Simo, our coach, and then coach to leadership group and line coaches, and then from there it's down to, to the playing group. Simo is very much everyone's going to can have an opinion. He wants to hear what you're what what we all think, and then he'll make pretty much make the decision based on on our opinions and what we think. Sometimes too many opinions is makes it very hard to make a decision. You're not going to please everyone. 
But yeah, he's pretty much got his, his core group. It's pretty much the, the leadership group. It's his core group, which he'll make a decision based off. So yeah, we, we, we meet once a week and pretty much make decisions on what we think. And, um, a lot of the meetings that we have is holistic, like I've, I've said about the whole group. And it's, it's a lot about culture. How's the culture going? How are individual players going? Are we happy with the way we're performing? Are we happy with what's working well? What's not working well? Um, it's actually very much, which I've found I'm on a, on a, couple of foundation boards and it's, it is very similar to board board meetings you know we minutes are taken sometimes on, on, on what we're talking about but very much what's working well what do we need to fix and, and how we need to fix it um, and then we sort of have objectives from there and um, each individual has something they need to sort of nut out throughout that week um, and then yes yeah, it's, it's weekly meetings we, we'll be doing those the leadership stuff weekly if not two or three times a week he'll just he'll call a quick one if we need to have a quick chat but um, he's very much communicating with us yeah daily weekly on different levels but yeah it goes board ceo then simo simo is pretty much internals footy stuff obviously ceo is more holistic um, with the whole direction of the footy club off the field and he sort of lets simo do his thing with the boys halfway through this year i think it was i, I imagine some most teams would be going through it but that's that was a big massive mindset change and it's, it, it's one of the great i love it, it's a great analogy um it's yeah we that was pretty much what people some teams do go out not to lose because they can't win if that makes it's very hard for them to win so they go well we need to hedge our bets let's just not lose by too much and let's make it respectful a respectful loss if there is one um but ours is yeah we're, we're very much play to win and it's, and it's getting on the front foot a little bit more um structurally the way we're thinking and being more aggressive in in different areas but um, yeah, that's that's get that gets spoken spoken about a bit now at our footy club because a lot of people do that. You do just how do we hedge our bets and how do we sort of not lose by too much or um change things so we don't lose by too much or you're gonna are you gonna stick your nuts out there a little bit and go let's let's win and that that starts training for us starts how we training are we training just to get through uh, to make it to the weekend or are we are we training to get better are we training to to make sure we're prepped as well as we can for the weekend. So yeah, that's a, I'd, I'd imagine, hopefully no other clubs using it, but, um, I reckon, I reckon it, it's very, the trend through the AFL with this, it filters through very quick. We, we all end up doing the same thing pretty quickly. So yeah. for, for the guys at home, question around culture shift when that coach is coming in and out, how does that change? Yeah, so it, it did change massively. It's almost, yeah, it's just like a, it's almost a line in the sand. When I first, I didn't think the culture was bad. I think with, if you're not winning, Everyone's culture is pretty bad. There's not too many people who are, who are, have great cultures when they're not winning. Unfortunately, it's result, that's, everything's result driven. So we were losing. So the culture was, we could have done everything we could have done, done the culture group, or the culture was great. That's what I said. The playing group, we all, we were all training hard. We we're doing everything we could. We loved each other. You know, we we're sticking to our trademarks and things, but I, I felt like the game had sort of gone past Bush a little bit. Um, the game had changed. Um, you sort of needed more a tactical coach. And I think Wushu knew that as well. But yeah, as soon as sort of it got to the point where we heard that Wusha was going to leave, everyone was sort of up in the air, what's going to happen? And then it was a line that said, all right, has gone. And then Simo's come in. Um, he obviously set the example of myself, but he comes straight in. His first press conference is pretty much, that's the, all right, what type of bloke's this guy? He's just got the job. What's he going to talk about? And his was family. He's, I want to, while I'm at the football club, I want to make this a family. I want to make it a family orientated footy club where everyone's accepted. And we're all different and it's pretty much from his first press conference and then coming in his first presentation to us was like, all right, well, this is different. A lot of the time there is a clean out of coaches as well. So it wasn't just Wusher. A lot of coaches go and the new coach would bring his coaches in. It was breath of fresh air, really. And then, yeah, it was him implementing his, well, the culture he sort of wanted uh, from the start. Well, like I said, was very much family orientated and it was a lot of, a lot of it was accepting care. And it was with that, it's accepting that everyone's different. And we've all got different backgrounds. We all look at things differently. And then it was the care side, like, do you actually care for your mates? Do you actually care for, for each other? And that was implemented really early. And I think that's a massive part of our success that we've had over the tenure with Simo. So yeah, he was always, his motto was fairly not equally because everyone's, like I said, everyone's, everyone's completely different. The day that we all sort of nutted out and we, we build our relationships with each other, um, was the day you can actually communicate better. When I, when I get to know, yourself a lot better I can communicate better with you if we don't really have a good relationship or respectful relationship it's very hard to give feedback um, so he was very much boys you need to build your bonds 
you need to build relationships with everyone, you need to understand everyone. Um, a lot of it, an easy example is obviously our Indigenous boys, completely different backgrounds, completely different upbringing, completely different things that those lads go through. I'm fortunate enough, I've been involved with some Indigenous communities and I've been around it my whole life, so I've got some understanding, but some people don't. Uh, so how do we, how do I tell Liam Ryan that he's not training hard enough? If I don't have a relationship with him, he's going to think I'm an idiot, and rightly so. But if I've got a good relationship with Liam, I understand him and have a chat to him about how he got here and um, his journey is completely different and you actually gain respect, but you gain the rapport. And Simo was, was very, is, was very big, it still is very big on that, um, when he come in, but, yeah, it was it was good. It was a positive thing uh, for the football club, but it was very much it was like yeah, very much line in the sand. It was within two days the whole thing had changed, and he was a he's a strong leader. So he wanted even down to what's hanging on the walls. He wanted more memorabilia on the walls. He wanted more history of the football club on the walls. You know, he wanted our players to do a bit more on the legacy of the footy club. Do we all know the legacy of the football club? You know, the spirit, the mateship <coughs> side. He was very big on that, but yeah, it, it changed changed very quickly. For the guys at home, um, <laughs> question around self-belief and how can we instill that in the future generations and really make sure that they don't get to their twenties and and uh, look for them externally. Yeah, that's, so that's probably our biggest challenge, I think, or as especially the footy club is is how do we try and get give give these kids confidence? And there's a lot of different ways of doing it. Sometimes you can give them obviously give them too much confidence um, and they take it the wrong way. But a lot of it is. A lot of it's they, the, the kids and people, they, they know how to work hard. So they, they, kids come in, they work really hard. It's just more finding examples and finding different ways to give them that confidence whenever it arises. Um, a big one for us is we can't just give a kid confidence if he hasn't really done anything. We need him to, to commit to something um, and do it. Um, and then when he does acknowledge it, uh, it's just how do you acknowledge it now? So me just giving him a, a pat on the back is probably not going to, he's going to, oh, cool, great. Where I love that. I loved when Coxie would just give me a, Slap on the bum and go, mate. Fuck, how good was that? I'm freaking. Whoop. <laughs> I'm running around for days. I can't fit out the door. But a lot of it is, it, a lot of it's actually you need to acknowledge it in front of the group and in front of people, in front of social media. Unfortunately, sometimes that's uh, that that is a big driver how how people perceived externally. But it's just it's more of it is is training um, for us and and how we change mindset mindset how they view things and what they value. As individuals, what do you, what do you value? It? Do you, if they do value external acknowledgement, well, we've got to find out a way of, of trying to do that. Or do you value what your teammates think? Do you value what your coaches think? And then off the back of that, you can start it propping up, uh, up as much as possible. But I, I, if I had the exact answer for it, I'd, with all our young kids would be the greatest of all time. I wouldn't, uh, have any issue, but that, that is, that is a challenge for us at the moment, trying to give them that confidence as much as we can, obviously without giving them too much, but, um, yeah, a lot of it's just that it starts with what type of person they are and get to know. Them. For us, I've, I've really got to get to know these young kids. I'm third, nearly 30 with three kids. Um, and I've got young fella got drafted yesterday. He'd be 18. So I can't exactly go out to the nightclub with this 18 year old and, and get to know him. You know, no, I, I could. I'd be getting, I'd be, I'd be in a lot of trouble. But, um, you know, those sort of things that what the 18 year olds do is completely different to what I'm doing. Uh, so I, the biggest thing for, I've got to build a relationship with this this young fella and how do I do it and there's a lot of different ways of doing it a lot of it is social media so I'll follow him on Instagram um, as soon as possible and, and like a couple of his photos and that'll that'll start it you know that's that's that yeah so but that's yeah but that's the thing it's just like that that's just the way it is and that and, and you've just really got to understand that you've really got it yeah I'm I'm beholden off from that I don't, I don't know about TikTok but one day you'll probably see me doing it to, to build a relationship with the boys but that's what it is I'll, I'll you got to really nut it down and, and spend some time with people and understand them and, and the same thing. Then you can help build their confidence. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so different. So how do you keep your team strong when you're down and out and it looks like you might be losing? How do you actually keep going for the win? Yeah. So sometimes we, you're 100 points down in the last quarter, you're not going to win, but you can get other wins. So my mentality is, all right, we're down by 100 points. We're not going to win this game of football. But what are we going to take out of it? So we've got last quarter. What? So my thing is, all right, this didn't work. We did whatever we had to do. It didn't work. Let's try something different. If you're going to lose by 100, why not lose by 120, 130? By trying something and learning something. So same thing with that. I'm, in my business, very similar. Um, we've got targets we want to meet. Um, and my business partners, he's the one who cops most of it. Uh, from myself, when we're looking at, we're, mate, we didn't meet these targets. What is it? 
more of it's what did we learn? Did we learn something? All right, so it's not a complete loss because we learned something. And so that's that's my thing. Boys, we're going this last quarter. Let's keep the effort there because that's that's a given. And let's let's take something out of this game. Let's just take something out of this last quarter. If we can come out of the last quarter going, oh, that worked. That that worked really well for us in that ten minute period. We tried this and it worked really well. Let's look at implementing that. Um, where if you just go out there and keep doing the same thing and and lose, you're going, oh, great. We didn't really get gain anything out of this game. So I'm very similar with with business side of things. All right, well, this is why we we lost. We everyone sort of knows why they're not hitting targets or, or doing what they need to do or um, achieving what they want to achieve. It's more, oh, that's sort of not working. Let's try something a little bit different to see if that can work and learn from it. Uh, so that's that's that would be that's most of the time when we're in that touch. We're not in that situation too much, but very much is what can we take out of out of the loss? And that's that's the time. That's almost that's the best time to be honest. When you're losing, you're learning. When you're winning all the time, you don't really you do learn, but you're not you're not taking it. You don't learn as much as when you are losing. So I'll sort of, it's not a positive thing, but it also almost is. You go, boys, we've got smashed behind points. Well, how much did we learn? We know if we don't rock up, we don't, you know, put pressure on. We know when we don't do that, this is what happens. When you don't know your structures, boys, this is what happens. So it actually builds, builds unity and builds, oh, this is, these are, this didn't work. This is why, because we didn't complete these things. It's the same with in, in the business. I'll be saying the same thing. Why didn't we hit these times? Why didn't we get that job? And a lot of it is we'll reflect and go, oh, we didn't get it because, Oh, our price was right. Well, what's, what's the issue? Because we have a relationship. That's, that's, so then we go, oh, we're clear. I'm clear now. I'm very clear on what I need to do. And next, next month, the first thing I talk about is our pricing's right on our jobs. How's a relationship going with that client? Have we got a relationship there? Because sometimes it is just relationship stuff in, in your business world. It's, I just got a better relationship with, with someone else and the price is very much similar and they just want to go with it. So yeah, that's the biggest thing is just what can you take out of those, those losses? Um, let's take something out of it is, is the biggest one. I like you shared earlier as well. Even when you're down, it's like if you're, if you're hitting the KPIs, it's like the results will come. Yeah. Cause as well, a business is a, is a marathon, mm-hmm. not, so it's like you might not hit your goals of, of this quarter, but if you keep building relationships, you keep pitching, you keep getting out there, eventually the wins will come. It's like a lagging indicator of the effort you put in. Um, and if not, it's more, they're not coming. What is it we need to look and review and talk and, and figure out what it is? But um, most of the time, everyone sort of has a finger on a little bit. We sort of know what it is, and that's the thing. You can't. You got to accept you can't win them all. There's going to be times where you're going to be down. It's just how. Same thing when that pressure comes, and the pressure comes when we're not performing. So how do you how do you react in those situations? So in that last quarter, it's well, let's just stay calm and take something out of this. It's the same with business. That's all right. This, these things sort of happen, and um, how do we make sure this? Try, try not to make this happen again. Take something out of it.